Let me start with the ridiculous. Michael Fabricant used to share an office corridor with me and therefore shared a postman. He answered for me the almost indecipherable question, is it a wig, by telling me that Michael Fabricant had in fact three wigs. One that looked like he just had a haircut, one that was the optimal length and one that was so long and unkempt that it looked like he needed a haircut, which the next week he would appear to have. A more ridiculous figure, it's hard to imagine in the British Parliament. And yet all day and every day, and he's now trending number one on Twitter in Britain, Michael Fabricant seems to be Boris Johnson's most stalwart defender. I make no criticism of that. It's good to be loyal to your leader if you feel that you can be, uh, but it tells a story uh, that Michael Fabricant is Boris Johnson's most indefatigable defender. It tells the story that he's definitely not out of the woods. That's because somebody called Sue Gray, this entire show is about people you've never heard of, by the way, Billy Rag, Nusrat Ghani, Sue Gray. She could be a character from Little Britain, for all I know. But she holds the fate of the British Prime Minister in the palm of her hand right now. Because on Tuesday, she will report on her investigation into parties at Downing Street during the lockdown. How many trestle tables constitutes a party? How many sausage rolls makes the distinction between a work event and a party? How far apart were the party goers when they clinked their wine glasses? All of that big stuff is coming out on Tuesday. And actually, the British media is filled with virtually nothing else. That and another cockamamie story are that the whips in Parliament have been putting the thumbscrews on recalcitrant members of Parliament. I've not got any thumbs. After nearly 30 years of being thumbed screwed, you would find it difficult to straighten my thumbs. The idea that Scotland Yard should be invited in to roam around the corridors of the House of Commons because Somebody called Billy Rag, who's called a senior Tory MP, he's 34 in fact, and has been in Parliament for six years. That means he came in in 2015. He's 34 years old, but he's a senior Tory MP. They're always senior when a journalist wants to add weight and gravitas to the story. He claims are that the Conservative Whip's office put the heavy on him in order to get him to vote in a certain way. It then turned out that actually he was accusing Pike, Gavin Williamson, don't tell him your name, Pike, of having threatened to withdraw a school that was to be built in his constituency if he did not Uh, support the government's line, I think it was on free school meals. Now, I served under a lot of whips and I observed the conservative whips very closely, particularly Mrs. Thatcher's Svengali, uh, whose name currently escapes me, was something obscure and exotic, quixotic, like Tristan Garrel Jones with a hyphen in between. I studied the efforts, the movements of these people very closely. But of course, uh, for much of that nearly 30 years, I was a Labour MP. So I served under Sergeant Major Lay Whips, who did indeed threaten to stand on your toes to uh, give you one in the, uh, the Rollocks, uh, and who certainly made sure that you never served on any committee that you would like to have served upon, but put you, like me, in exile 
on parliamentary committees that lasted literally four years, every Tuesday and every Thursday. Four years I sat on the King's Cross Railway Bill. It was a combination of browbeating uh, with the occasional blandishment because they could never get their wicked way with me. I never got many blandishments, but I got a lot of browbeating. The Labour Chief Whip, Nick Brown, who ultimately became a friend of mine, he attended our wedding in Parliament uh, some 10 years ago. But he used to browbeat me daily. Sometimes he was browbeating me for the government. Other times he was browbeating me for Gordon Brown, who he wanted to be the government. Uh, but either way, he bullied me, and I never told anybody about it, because it would be frankly demeaning to me to tell people that I, as a grown man, was being bullied by another grown man. I, as a member of parliament, was being bullied by another member of parliament. Usually I just told him to get on his bike or words to that effect, which is what Billy Ragg should have done. And Genghis Khan's mate, the new Labour MP for Bury South. But I've got to tell you the idea that the police should be brought in. The police, what next? The King's forces? Parliament is supposed to be a place uh, that is its own sovereign space. I'll be talking to John McTurner, who endured, if that's the word, life under Tony Blair in 10 Downing Street. I'll be asking him about the party culture and how many trestle tables he's eaten sausage rolls off later in the show. But the big news, the most important story, is the one unfolding way to the east of us, many thousands of miles from here, to which British men and material are currently being dispatched, having to take the long way round uh, because Germany wants nothing to do with the airlift that's going on from London to Kiev. I refer, of course, to the absolutely imminent Russian invasion of the Ukraine, which has been absolutely imminent since before Christmas and is absolutely imminent tomorrow or next week. Although I saw a Ukrainian general saying today, actually Easter, they thought, would be the optimal time if such a thing were to happen. Our media, which lied to us about Iraq, lied to us about weapons of mass destruction, lied to us about Yugoslavia, lied to us about Afghanistan, lied to us about Libya, lied to us about Syria. The lying liars are lying again. And yet, and yet, there are fools who walk and live among us, who, as a knee jerk, can be dragooned into line with the same old questions. Well, what are we going to do about Putin, about Russia? I always hold myself back from saying, who's we? Who are you that you imagine that with a total armed force that could fit into Villa Park, Aston Villa's football ground, the entire Navy, the entire Air Force, the entire Army could fit comfortably into Villa Park. There are more people on the waiting list for season tickets at Manchester United than you have in your entire armed forces. Russia, on the other hand, is a hypersonic, thermonuclear, superpower, and the Russian border is in Russia. You are in Britain. Who gave you the idea that you might have to do something about events taking place thousands of miles away between Russia 
and one of its neighbors. But the imperial mentality is quite difficult to shake off. There are still people in this country, I see them, even on my Twitter feed, and I thought I'd purged the most stupid from my Twitter feed, but no, even on my Twitter feed, I see fools falling into line with the state-backed propaganda that Russia has somehow done something wrong and must be punished by us, imagine. Well, let me tell you something. Russia is no threat to us. Russia is not threatening us. But we are a threat to Russia, and we are threatening Russia. Our forces are on Russia's borders. Russia's forces are not on our borders, and have never been on our borders. As a matter of fact, but for Russia's alliance with us in the Second World War, I'd be talking to you now in German. Although, of course, I wouldn't be because there would be no such program as this, and no such person like me would be left alive. But far from treasuring, cherishing, even at this distance, that warm memory of the wartime alliance, we have been brought up since 1945 on a steady, diet of hatred against Russia. In fact, it now reached the stage where we're told we should love Germany and Japan and hate Russia. That's how Orwellian all of this has become. Russia was accused in the British newspapers this morning of seeking to install pro-Russian ministers in charge of the Ukraine. The absolute reverse of what actually happened in real life in 2014, when a coup took place in Ukraine to overthrow the elected president, burn down the parliament, and sign the MPs being held at gunpoint. New laws that outlawed the Russian language in Ukraine, even though a quarter of all citizens in Ukraine are Russian nationals, many of them now citizens as well as nationals. Their ethnicity is Russian. Their language and culture is Russian. But it was suddenly outlawed by a regime installed in a coup paid for, organized, inspired, and armored by the West, which now accuses Russia of conspiring to put pro-Russian ministers into the government in Kiev. Now, what happened to that 25% of the Ukrainian population? Well, they decided that they would not accept this coup. They were quite happy, most of them, with the elected president they already had. And so they declared themselves out with the writ of the coup authorities in Kiev, not the least because those authorities were resting on the militant fighting power of actual Nazis, people who wear swastikas, people who revere Bandera, the wartime Ukrainian nationalist leader who actually massacred Jews. I'm not making any of this up, dear viewer, dear listener. The Russian-speaking people in the east of Ukraine don't want to live under a government which is dependent on the street-fighting power of swastika-wearing, jackboot-stomping, 
followers of the Ukrainian Nazi leader. Now, I don't believe for one single minute that Russia is going to invade Ukraine. There's a clue if you're doing the poll. Not for one minute do I believe that Russia wants to take over the basket case, which is Ukraine, the sick man of Europe, which is about, according to the financial newspapers and journalists in Ukraine itself, about to default upon its debt. Who would want to take over Ukraine? Certainly not the European Union and not Russia either. But what they may very well happen, and maybe this week, unless talks on Monday, again between Blinken and Lavrov can avert it, what may very well happen is that Ukraine invades the Donbass in eastern Ukraine, where the people don't recognize the authority of Kiev and were granted in a agreement signed by the government in Kiev at Minsk that they would have autonomy. The Ukrainian forces now pumped full of Western weaponry may very well try to take advantage of this moment to attack the 25% of the Ukrainian population that doesn't want anything to do with them. And if that happens, then all bets are off because Russia clearly will not stand by and watch its compatriots slaughtered by the Ukrainian forces, their Azov Nazi battalions using Western weapons to do their dirty work. So the war might be coming yet. What will NATO do about it? Nothing. NATO will not fight to defend Ukraine. It will not go to war with Russia because it would be a very short war. A war that would end in a defeat more ignominious even than the defeat of the NATO forces who recently scuttled out in the middle of the night from Afghanistan, chased by men on bicycles, wearing sandals and carrying carbines. Russia ain't no Afghanistan. Russia ain't no Syria. Russia ain't no Iraq. The Russian army can really fight. Don't test them.